Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, thank you all for coming and welcome to the Sharmin and Bijan Mosav Rahmani Center for Iran and Persian Gulf Studies. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome our speaker today, Asaf Ashraf, um, to the Mosav Rahmani Center. Um, he is a doctoral candidate in the Department of History at Yale, and he specializes in the history of Iran and the Middle East. Uh, he is currently working on his dissertation, which is titled From Khan to Shah, Social Ties and the Formation of the Qajar State in Iran, 1785-1848. to In his work, he demonstrates how political elites in Qajar Iran were embedded in social and economic relations with broader society. An answer to the question of how and why the Qajars were able to establish a new state after decades of political instability. More broadly, his interests include the history of Iran from the early modern to the present, comparative early modern Muslim empires, travel literature, and the culture and economy of gift giving. Asaf is the author of an upcoming publication in comparative studies in society and history titled The Politics of Gift Exchange in Early Qajar, Iran, 1785 to 1834. Please join me in a warm round of applause for him. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you also to Rose and to Reagan and to the Mosavar Rahmani Center for inviting me to speak here today and for arranging, for arranging this. Um, I'm very happy to be speaking here. Um, today I'm going to speak about uh, gift giving in early 19th century Iran from the perspective of someone who is interested in explaining how and why the Qajar state formed during this time. I will show that gifts and tributes were a central component of Qajar political culture and argue that they were fundamental to the political and economic functioning of the emerging Qajar state. Before delving in though, let me begin with a brief story. In November 1800, John Malcolm, the English East India Company's representative who had been sent to Iran to conclude a treaty of, of alliance and thwart French influence with the Qajars, reached Tehran after leaving Bombay nearly a year earlier. Malcolm's first audience with Fat Ali Shah was brief and cons consisted of only a few pleasantries and greetings. But his second meeting on November, 2nd, uh, November 27th excuse me, lasted much longer and began with a noteworthy diplomatic and political gesture. Watches glittering with jewels, caskets of gold beautifully enameled, lusters of variegated glass, richly cased guns and pistols of curious construction, marvels of European science as air guns and electrifying machines, a diamond of great value, and mirrors that had been brought up with much toil were spread out before the Shah and presented as gifts. Malcolm wrote in his journal that as the Shah secretary announced the presence, he felt anxious, worried that the gifts would be referred to simply as tributes or offerings instead of the rarities and curiosities that they to Malcolm at least, were. Malcolm's anxiety must have been short-lived, however, because after the secretary concluded, the Shah expressed his gratitude and spent an hour conversing affably with the envoy. Many of the themes one would need to cover in dealing with the history of gift-giving in 19th century Iran are covered in this story. The role gifts played in nurturing diplomatic <coughs> and political relationships, the importance of giving an appropriate gift, the subtle distinction, if not in reality, at least in perception, between gifts and tributes, and the material culture of the objects exchanged. And although the point is not explicitly made in Malcolm's journal, this story and Malcolm's mission more broadly also alludes to a more significant development in Iranian history during the late 18th and early 19th centuries namely the formation of a new state under the Qajars. The collapse of the Safavid Empire in 1722 resulted in decades of political instability and turmoil in Iran, a period that Anne Lambton 
has described as witnessing a, quote, tribal resurgence and a decline in the bureaucracy, end quote. In fact, Malcolm's mission in 1800 was the first time in over a century that a political mission from Europe had been sent to Iran, in part because of Iran's political circumstances during the 18th century. At the same time, the emergence of the Rajar state <laughs> occurred simultaneously with what is by now a well-known development in global history. The late 18th century represented a turning point in the history of empires, with the emergence of the so-called Second British Empire and the European imperial rivalry best represented by the Napoleonic Wars. But what is less well known and what is the subject of this talk, as well as the broader project from which this talk is taken, are the contours of the emerging Qajar political culture, the ways in which Qajar political elites cultivated ties with broader society, and ultimately how Qajar rulers governed a vast territory 100,000 square miles larger than contemporary Iran. The giving of gifts, tributes, and honors has a long history in the statecraft and administration of the Persianate world and was seen as a direct reflection of a sovereign's just and by extension legitimate rule. Stories in Ferdowsi's Shah Nameh, for example, in which subjects give gifts pledge, while pledging allegiance to kings, provide evidence for the long history of gift giving in Iran and the Persian world. It has been exciting to see the recent attention this subject has received, particularly from art historians and scholars of material culture. In 2011, for example, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston organized a major exhibition on the gifts of the Sultan, which included pieces of Islamic art spanning from the 8th to the 19th centuries and from three continents. <coughs> After long being a neglected topic, gift giving in the Iranian context has become the subject of a growing body of historical literature as well. In spite of this growing scholarship, however, many areas remain underexplored. Chief among them is the role of gifts in political culture, administration, and state-building projects of Iranian history. Part of the explanation for the dearth of scholarship on what may be called the political economy of gifts may lie in their ubiquity. Gifts are mentioned so often that it is easy to gloss over them, like food, animals, disease, and other aspects of life that appear frequently in historical sources, it can be difficult to determine what, if any, broader uh, political and economic significance they had. In this talk, I begin from the assumption that gift exchange can help us understand broader historical developments and propose to use gift giving as a lens through which to examine Rajar statecraft and governance during the early 19th century. There are countless references to gifts in Qajar Farman's decrees, letters, diplomatic correspondence, chronicles, poetry, among others, uh, providing ample evidence that gift exchange constituted a significant part in administering the Qajar state. The resuscitation of Pishkesh, displays of largesse, and the giving of gifts and honors were part of the effort to legitimize Qajar authority whose rule, unlike the Safavids, was not based primi primarily on religious claims to authority. In the remainder of the talk, I will focus on three kinds of exchange that illustrate the function of gifts in the Qajar state. The Pishkesh, uh, which was a tributary gift-giving ceremony from the ruled to the rulers. Gifts and honors from rulers to subjects, the best, of, uh, the best example of which is the khil'at, or the robes of honor, and diplomatic gifts. I will begin by demonstrating that the Pishkesh was fundamental to the politics and economy of Qajar Iran and was part of the process of presenting Qajar rule as a continuation of previous Iranian royal di dynasties. Nevertheless, Pishkesh ceremonies also highlight the real limitations Qajar rulers faced in exerting power in the peripheries of their vast territory. On the other hand, gifts and honors to Shi'i religious 
to the, to the Shi'i religious establishment as well as to broader Iranian society were part of Ajar rulers' strategy of presenting themselves as just and legitimate. Finally, gifts were also used to influence diplomacy and facilitate relations between Iranians and foreign envoys. At the same time, however, the story of Qajar gifts is not simply a story of political elites. The exchange of gifts to and from the state reflected a culture of exchange that existed within broader 19th century Iranian society and enmeshed the elite in social and economic relations that helped sustain their rule. The, de the depictions of Qajar rulers as autocratic or arbitrary that often features in the historiography of Iran obscures the fact that political practices like gift giving were an extension of the cultural norms of giving that existed in wider society. What distinguished political gifts were the rituals associated with them and the potential for violence if obligations were not met. Gift exchange in Qajar Iran reminds us that as Karl Polanyi and others have pointed out, pre-modern political and economic systems were, as a rule, embedded in social relations. Here I would like to stress a couple points. First, the history about which I will be speaking draws on a rich array of sources, including the farmans, letters, diplomatic correspondence, and other sources that I mentioned a moment ago, many of which remain in manuscript form in libraries and archives scattered across Iran, Turkey, Britain, France, and Russia. Second, I use the sources to explain how Qajar political, the, uh, Qajar, how Qajar politi uh, political culture was established and how the Qajars governed one of the largest states in the Islamic world at its time, and one of the few to survive well into the 20th century. This notion of governance, what Christine Filio, writing about the Ottoman Empire at the turn of the 19th century, has defined as the, quote, project of keeping a political order in place, including the formal state apparatus, but also the many relationships in society involving institutions, networks, individuals, customs, and beliefs that contribute to upholding that order, end quote, should be placed at the center of analysis of the Qajar state. The exchange of gifts, I, as I will demonstrate, uh, provides a good example of how early Qajar rulers governed both domestically and diploma diplomatically. Gifts, tributes, and honors were the backbone of Qajar state and society. Their abundance in the Qajar period has led some observers to share the view of George Curzon, the British statesman of the imperial era, that gift exchange constituted what he called the cardinal and differentiating feature of Iranian administration and that there was something exceptional about Iranian and Qajar gift-giving practices. In fact, evidence suggests that gift-giving practices uh, were shared across pre-modern Eurasia and that tribute systems, of which those practices were a part, were a uniformity and a widely shared element of culture. Early Qajar rulers relied not only on an, on an established administrative class to serve in their bureaucratic ranks, they also drew on pre-existing practices like gift giving that they inherited from the Safavid and post-Safavid eras. In that sense, gift exchange was a vital component of Qajar administration and political life, but one that it shared with other tributary empires and which should not be reified to the level of cultural difference. In order to begin to understand the politics of gift giving in Qajar Iran, it might be useful to take a moment to reflect on the broader ethics, what Marcel Mauss has referred to as the spirit of the gift, that at least partly motivated and help us understand the exchange of gifts in Qajar Iran. There are about a dozen words in Persian that are used to refer to gifts. Some of the words, like armaran and sorat, are used only in specific contexts while others, like in'am, in'ayat, and pishkesh, imply a difference in the status and rank between the ones doing the giving and the one receiving the gift. Moreover, the ethics of generosity and ritualized gift-giving that all individuals, but especially rulers, 
were encouraged to cultivate were described in Andaz, or Advice for Princes books, such as the 13th century Adab al Harb al Shuja'a or Sa'adi's Golistan. Beyond these linguistic and normative conceptualizations, however, gifts were per pervasive in Qajar politics and economy. The Pishkesh accounted for, by some ex estimates, nearly half of the government's annual revenue in the early 19th century. It was counted as a separate category from the fixed revenue, the Maliyat. Administratively, the responsibility for making note of the gifts that came into the central treasury fell on the shoulders of the Pishkesh Nevis, the registrar of the Pishkesh. The origins of this office are unclear, but it existed at least since the Safavid period uh, in the Taskirat al-Muduk, the early 18th century manual of Safavid administrative practices. The Pishkesh Nevis is described as the person who, whenever pres presents were brought to the king, would make a detailed list of the objects before handing the list over to the chief royal eunuch uh, and was paid an annual salary of 15 tomans in addition to one-tenth of the one-tenth tithe levied on the gifts. Whether the office existed in the early Qajar period is difficult to tell, although we do have registers of received gifts from the Nasiruddin Shah period, <coughs> suggesting that the position existed in the latter half of the 19th century. And this here is a, uh, a folio from one of the registers of Pishkesh that was received uh, during the Nasruddin Shah period. This is uh, a manuscript that's from the Majlis Library Collection in Tehran. Uh, you may not be able to see, but this partic these particular entries are from 1301 and 1302 of the Islamic ca calendar, so uh, 1883 and 1884 in the Gregorian calendar. So we have these registers from the late 19th century. What we do have from the early 19th, cent uh, early 19th century, however, are numerous farmans and ragams, which the Shah or Prince Governor sent acknowledging Pishkesh offerings, and which functioned as a kind of receipt of payment, as well as a public acknowledgement of tribute paid. The most important occasion on which Pishkesh offerings were made were the Nowruz processions. And some of the best descriptions uh, we have of these ceremonies come from European travelers to Iran in the early 19th century. In 1812, William Usley managed, with the assistance of an Iranian friend, to view the procession from a private viewing booth. He observed the king sitting in a small room overlooking the Maidan, the square of the Tehran citadel, watching as a long line of over 100 mules each carrying on its back a beautiful Indian shawl and a bag containing 1,000 tomans in gold coin sent by the Amina Dola of Isfahan make its way through the gates. James Fraser, traveling through Iran in 1821 and 1822, estimated that the Shah received between 1 million and 1.2 million tomans during the Nowruz processions. And although cash was the preferred form, shawls, jewels, horses, goods, and other merchandise were also given. This is an image uh, uh, from a manuscript copy of the Shah and Shah Nameh, which was a, a book that was um, uh, ordered by Fat Ali Shah to be written, modeled on Ferdowsi's Shah Nameh. Uh, this Shah and Shah Nameh was meant to glorify Fat Ali Shah's reign and um, d uh, provides kind of a chronicle of his rule. There are numerous images in this particular manuscript. This is a manuscript from the British Library. And here is an image of uh, Mirza Reza Qoli, Munchi al Mamalek, uh, offering his Pishkesh to the king. Of course, on the provincial and local level, the annual Nowruz gifts were in more modest amounts. A series of letters in the collection of Mirza Ali Khan Qadimi, probably from the late 1820s, mentions small New Year's gifts given by notables in Azerbaijan in amounts ranging from 50 to 200 tomans. The Nowruz processions doubled as an opportunity for Qajar administrators in the capital to learn about the conditions and concerns in the provinces, and they demonstrate 
some of the tensions in center-periphery relations in the early Qajar period. On the one hand, provincial leaders and notables used the opportunity to bring their requests and petitions to the Shah and had them read in his presence in a highly formal and ceremonious manner, similar to other royal function, functions in Qajar Iran. On the other hand, provincial governors and leaders were under pressure to meet their obligations and secure their positions by raising the necessary amounts of cash and goods to send as gifts to the king, a reality that supports Christoph Werner's depiction uh, of the gradual but fitful appropriation of urban elites into the Qajar administration during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The precarious situation of provincial governors who were caught between the demands of the capital and of their local realities is illustrated by the case of Hussein Ali Mirza, the Prince Governor of Fars. In 1829, Fat Ali Shah marched on Fars with 6,000 troops in order to collect the arrears of Pishkesh and taxes his son owed. As the royal retinue made its way to Shiraz, it collected money uh, from villages and towns through which it passed despite the attempts by some residents to hide out of fear. Upon arriving in Shiraz, a group of leading notables uh, met the Shah in order to hold him off. And after a couple days, Hossein Ali Mirza was able to collect 200,000 tumans to give to his father. Other examples include the case of two representatives, again from Fars, who were summoned to appear before Fat Ali Shah in May 1808. After the representatives finished providing an account of the conditions uh, in the province, the Shah asked them if they had brought the 70,000 tomans they owed as Pishkesh. When it became clear that the two men did not have it, the Shah summoned his servants to beat them and throw them out the window, at which point the Amin Adola offered himself as security for the payment of the arrears, saving the lives of the two individuals. Qajar chronicles usually depict Pishkesh offerings in starkly different terms, mentioning them in passing with little discussion of the, um, uh, of the items or the amount given. Instead, it was more important to note who was giving the Pishkesh, from where it came, and whether it was, quote, a fitting tribute, what in Persian was referred to as Pishkesh al For example, in 1787, when Agha Muhammad Khan, uh, Khan's political authority was still largely confined to northern Iran and the Zans in southern Iran still made competing claims to rule, Zakaria Khan arrived in Tehran with, quote, gifts, presents, and a petition of loyalty, end quote. After presenting the Pishkesh, he was invested with a robe of honor and returned home. The defining detail provided in the chronicle about Zakaria Khan was that he was a notable from Georgia who served as the deputy to the governor of Tbilisi, a point that Reza Qoli Khan Hidayat, the author of Tariq Rozat as Safa and Nasiri, the chronicle from which the story is taken, no doubt made to underscore the tributary status of Georgia to Agha Muhammad Khan and Qajar rule. It was usually in those cases where the item given helped reinforce Qajar authority that the, art, that the chronicles specify the object, uh, the object given. For example, we know from Tariq Zul that in 1801, Haji Muhammad Hossein Khan, the governor of Isfahan, offered the gem-studded sun throne as a pishkesh to the king. Um, this is another image from the same uh, Matt, the Shah and Shah Nama manuscript from the British Library. Uh, again, another Pishkesh ceremony being depicted here, and the king, Fat Ali Shah, is sitting on that sun throne that was given to him as uh, a gift, as a Pishkesh. And this is another image of Fat Ali Shah sitting on the same sun, sun throne. This is um, taken from the murals that were on the Negaristan Museum and Palace in Tehran. The point here is not to prove whether all Pishkesh payments were made voluntarily or motivated by sincere wishes to pay tribute, but instead to demonstrate that the Pishkesh served a political function as a legitimizing tool. Anne Lambton's essay on the subject was framed on the question whether the, uh, of whether the Pishkesh was a free gift or a tribute. 
and took a macro historical approach in arguing that what had originally been a free gift evolved over the centuries to quote a tribute imposed on individuals and communities and a tax attached to the land and to certain offices end quote. But the evidence suggests that pishkesh was an ambiguous, ambiguous term that in fact was meant to both <coughs> that in fact was meant to be both a free gift and a tribute. Early Rajar rulers viewed the pishkesh as a demonstra demonstration of ro uh, loyalty that subjects should want to give, and not as a tax or as a kind of imposed bribe. In a letter Abbas Mirza wrote to his brother, Rokna Dole, in August 1829, he defends himself against accusations that he solicited a bribe from the Amina Dole. He uses the word reshve and goes on to say that if the Amina Dole wants to give anything, let it be a pishkesh given of his own free will not a payment given in the name of others. Again, this is not meant to suggest that there was in reality a clear line that marked the difference between the pishkesh and bribes, but simply to illustrate the fact that at a discursive level, Qajar rulers viewed the two in different terms. If the reception of pishkesh from vassals and subjects was crucial to the Qajars' presentation of themselves as legitimate rulers, then equally important was the display of largesse by rulers in the form of redistributing wealth and granting honors uh, and best represented by the ethos of generosity found in the mirrors for princes literature. Fath Ali Shah uh, patronized the construction, renovation, and reconstruction of more buildings than any ruler since Shah Abbas I. He extended the Golestan Palace in Tehran rebuilt the city walls, renovated religious shrines in Mashhad and Qom, and also sponsored projects in other cities like Kashan, Simnan, Qazvin, and Zanjan, and many others. The most important manifestation of the Qajar's patronage, however, was towards the Shi'i political, uh, religious establishment. Excuse me. The power vacuum and political turbulence of Iran's 18th century contributed, as is now well known, to an assertion of authority by, religious, by Shi'i religious leaders that temporal rulers like the Qajars had to manage. Financial assistance, gifts, and a general show of generosity towards these religious leaders, therefore, were crucial elements in gaining their support. A case from early in Fat Ali Shah's reign provides a telling example of how the language of generosity was used in official correspondence and illustrates the political etiquette and strategy of the Shah with regard to Shi'i centers uh, of power. In 1802 or 1803, Fatali Shah sent five go golden chandeliers, 217 tomans in cash, and about 217 loads of goods to the Imam Reza shrine in Mashhad. The gifts, arrived, uh, the gifts came a few years after a rebellion and famine in Nishapur, and just a few months after another rebellion and famine in Mashhad the latter being resolved only with the intercession of the Mujtahid Mirza Muhammad Mehdi. The Farman announcing Fath Ali Shah's gifts also stated that Mullah Ali Asghar, the Mullah Bashi, and the, quote, refuge of grandeur and munificence, the preeminent theologian and essence of the learned men, end quote, would be entrusted with bringing the chandeliers, cash, and goods to Mashhad. This glowing description of Mullah Ali Asghar masks the reality that he was, in fact, often reprimanded by Fat Ali Shah for his drunken and dissolute behavior. It is more likely that he was selected for the task because of his long-standing loyalty to Qajar rule, a point to which the Farman alludes by referring to him as a, quote, long-standing servant of the state. Other examples include 100,000 Tomans Fath Ali Shah sent in 1798-1799 for the repair of the golden dome and shrine of Fatima in Qom, the construction a couple of years later of the Faizia, a new seminary, as well as repairs to the Imam Askari uh, Mosque, the hospital, caravanserai baths, and bazaar in Qom. In a letter that Fath Ali Shah sent to Mirza Abu Qasim uh, Qomi, an influential scholar and teacher in Qom, the Shah wrote that he was sending 100 tomans to Qomi personally and another 100 tomans to be given to the poor. 
Of course, gifts of this sort were not confined to leaders of the Shi'i community. A letter that Qa'im Maqam wrote to Asif al-Dawla, Fath Ali Shah's chief minister, illustrates how Qajar rulers could take satisfaction in their own generosity when providing assistance, um, uh, providing assistance to the general populace. After a particularly terrible raid by Turkmen tribes in Khorasan resulted in food shortages, uh, uh, food shortages and other difficulties, Abbas Mirza, who was serving as governor of the province at the time, ordered the distribution of Kashmir shawls, overcoats, and broadcloths to residents suffering from the, co from the cold. Qa'im Maram wrote to Asif al with pride that it was as if no ruse had arrived early and that the crown prince, in spite of the food shortages, did not restrain from giving money and grain. These displays of generosity were complemented by the granting of honors and offices through the investiture of khil'at, or robe of honor, which was usually accompanied with appointment to political office. As with the Pishkesh, the origins of the khil'at are unclear, though one can find stories of the investiture of robes in sources at least as far back as the Old Testament, and Greek sources indicate that robes of honor were customary in Iranian courts in as early as the 5th century BC. In the context of Ghajar Iran, the Khil'at was given as a reward to those who had served the state, as in the case of Qazim Khan Javanshir, who in April 1829 was rewarded for his service during the recently concluded war against Russia, or Mahmud Khan, the deputy of Qaraghuzlu, who was given a Khil'at by Fath Ali Shah that was described as the fine golden copper robe and shawl. It may seem that the khil'at and investiture were superficial and in insignificant aspects of Qajar political culture, but it is important to keep in mind that the ties that bound individuals to the government were still very much being, for being formed in the early 19th century. Khil'at robes were in fact a meaningful method at strengthening those ties. Scholars like Chris Bailey and Jamal Ilyas have demonstrated the cultural cachet of cloth, its ability to serve as a vehicle for power and authority in places as diverse as early modern Iran and South Asia and medieval Spain. We get a glimpse of the particular power of cloth in the legends that circulated in 17th and 18th century India of the so-called killer khil'ats, poisoned dresses that allegedly contaminated and killed those who came in contact with the cloth. These, these tales were obviously folk legends, but even less fanciful Qajar textual sources convey the special influence of khil'ats. In a surprisingly frank letter that Amir Khan Sa'ardar wrote to Ali Pasha Khan Domboli, the scion of a politically influential and uh, powerful family from Khui. Amir Khan writes that he has heard that he will be given a khil'at soon. He then goes on to admit that he knows he has benefited from the good graces and favors of Abbas Mirza, but nevertheless is certain that the khil'at will only increase his own loyalty and the pleasure of serving the crown prince, what he described as zuhura husn khidmat al Having spoken about the ways gifts and honors functioned to build ties between rulers and the rule, let me switch gears a little and speak about diplomatic gifts. <coughs> As the story of John Malcolm with which this talk uh, began suggests, diplomatic gifts were most often exchanged when political negotiations and uh, alliances were at stake. In a letter dated January 28, 1808, Horace Sebastian, a French representative stationed in Istanbul, wrote to the foreign minister in Paris that he had recently seen Asghar Khan, the Iranian ambassador, pass through the city on his way to France. This was less than a year after the Treaty of Finkenstein when the Qajar state was seeking French assistance in its war against Russia. Sebastian wrote to the French minister that the Iranians had selected an, an appropriate and serious ambassador who would be pleasing for the minister, and that Asghar Khan was bringing many prized objects, including rare manuscripts and the swords of Tamerlane and Nadir Shah as presents. 
he went on to write that never had Asia given any European prince such dazzling marks of admiration. Gifts exchanged between diplomats and representatives of different countries were significant in part because they often marked the first encounter between cultures and as such were interpreted as a tangible and visible barometer of the political, economic, and social condition of the country from which the gifts came. <coughs> when Malcolm and his escorts arrived on the southern shores of Iran in 1799, they spent the first few months in the province of Fars before heading north towards Tehran. During their time in the south, they visited Shiraz, and upon entering the city, were greeted by the prince governor and other notables from the city, who inundated them with presents of ice creams, sweetmeats, preserves, and fruit. The quantity was so overwhelming that Malcolm would later recall that all in the camp, down to the keepers of the dogs, were busied in devouring these luxuries, leading one of the soldiers to extol Iran in between mouthfuls of food as a jewel of a country. But because gifts functioned as a material manifestation of cross-cultural encounters, they could have a double-edged double -edged quality to them. After Robert Kerr Porter, the English traveler, diplomat, and artist whose uh, travelogue, this is uh, the front piece to the front piece to the travelogue, uh, is replete with sketches and drawings, drew a portrait of Fat Ali Shah, this is his portrait of Fat Ali Shah, and presented it to the king, he bemoaned the fact that he had been rewarded for his service with, quote, 200 tomans and an old shawl with a hole in it, which his servants sold for 28 tomans. In the same letter, he wrote with envy of having seen an Iranian envoy recently returning from a trip to Vienna with a handsome gold box inlaid with diamonds and with a picture of the Austrian emperor valued at more than 1,000 tomans. What is important to keep in mind here is that, like the pishkesh and gifts exchanged within Ajar society, Diplomatic gifts helped forge ties and build relationships. But because of the context under which they were exchanged, the question of whether they were fitting or, or appropriate was loaded with cultural weight. Thus, we find William Oosley relating a story that took place in 1811 of a villager welcoming the Oosley entourage into his home and offering sweetmeats and fruit as a form of welcome. The villager, no doubt, hoping to impress the English ambassador, went on and proceeded to offer his entire home and garden as a gift to the Englishman. Instead of taking this as a sign of hospitality, Oosley read it as a yet another sign of the insincerity of Iranians, as he put it. The story with which I began this talk of Malcolm bringing presents and rarities, as he put it, to the court of Fat Ali Shah and privately expressing concern that they would be referred to as mere tributes, points to the potential pitfalls of giving an inappropriate diplomatic gift. Malcolm arrived in Iran after spending years in Mughal, Mughal, India, after all, and would have been familiar with Pishkesh ceremonies and the expectations that came with it. The European fascination with the uh, the European fascination with the Qajar's Order of the Lion and Sun, the highest honor Qajar rulers bestowed upon foreign diplomats, makes sense when we keep in mind that the medallion resembled European honors and distinctions, and therefore was intelligible to them. Although Iranian monarchs used the image um, of uh, the crouching, crouching lion with the sun rising behind it for centuries, Malcolm claimed to have seen coins from the Seljuk period bearing it as the arms of a local prince. Fat Ali Shah created the order that bore the image, which you see here, in 1808. The order, like the westernized Nizam al-Jadid troops that were formed around the same time, may have been inspired by the Ottomans, since Sultan Selim III had established an, uh, an analogous decorative order, uh, the Imperial Order of the Crescent, which is this one on the right, in 17. 99. Fath Ali Shah gave this honorary mark to several early 19th century European dignitaries, including John Malcolm, but also Richard well Wellesley, Gore Oosley, General Gardin, General Yermolov, among others, usually resulting uh, in these men relaying the news excitedly to their respective imperial capitals. Diplomatic gifts and honors, in short, 
carried weight only insofar that they had cultural meaning for their recipients. There's much more that could be said about the particulars of gift giving in uh, Qajar, Iran. Um, but because time is limited, let me just say a few uh, concluding remarks. What, what, does this, what does all of this mean? Having now spoken about gifts from subjects to rulers, the pishkesh, uh, gifts and honors from rulers to subjects, and diplomatic gifts, we can see that gift exchange permeated the political culture of the early Qajar state. Reports estimate that the Pishkesh made up nearly half of the total annual income of the Qajar state during the early years of the 19th century, making it also economically crucial. Because the Pishkesh was a practice with a long history, its resuscitation under the Qajars was a way for rulers to present themselves as rightful heirs to previous political dynasties. Thus, the repeated mention in Qajar chronicles of fitting tributes and appropriate gifts, and the distinction made between bribes and tributes. On the other hand, gifts from rulers to broader society were couched in the language of generosity and an ethos of giving to which rulers were expected to be committed. Although the particulars of gift exchange during the early Qajar period point to a fraught relationship between the political center and the provincial periphery, between rulers and the rules, there were, there were, for example, instances when pishkesh payments were not made. They also suggest the elusiveness of the boundary between state and society, and a, re and a reality in which individuals, customs, and beliefs were just as important to governance as institutions and administrative offices. Although the institutions and administration of the Qajar state have been the subject of much historical scholarship, less attention has been devoted to the social and cultural practices that helped forge the ties that bound individuals to the state. This talk has shed light on one of those practices and demonstrated the similarities between the Qajar state and other tributary empires. The question of governance, how and why were the Qajars able to form and rule over a new state is really the driving question behind the broader project from which this talk is taken. In order to answer this question, as I hope I have demonstrated, it is necessary to not only draw upon the Persian language chronicles of the early 19th century, as important as they are, but also on the overwhelming number of farmans, raghams, letters, poetry, and diplomatic correspondence from the period. Doing so allows us to move beyond the depiction of the Qajars as simply a, quote, tribal power, conquering former Safavid lands in one military campaign after another, and to illustrate the ways in which early Qajar rulers created an imperial kingship, incorporated provincial and tribal khans into the government, resolved domestic revolts and diplomatic disputes, and encountered European imperial powers. To conclude, I would like to mention just one final story. Earlier in this talk, I said that one can find stories, one can find in Ferdowsi's Shahnameh, tales of subjects giving rulers uh, gifts. In one of those stories, Ferdowsi describes a scene in which a group of nobles from various cities and regions in eastern Iran and Central Asia assemble and together they recount the periods of good and ill fortune in their homeland's history. Afra Siab's reign, they say, resulted in dark and bitter days, while Ke Khosro ruled over a peaceful world, free from strife. They finally reach their own time, and they give thanks that their ruler, the Sasanian emperor Kasra Anushirvan, has established justice, Dod, in his realm, and therefore caused his people to become rich and prosperous. Ferdosi goes on to say that representatives from the different regions of the Sasanian kingdom gathered before the Shah and with one heart and one tongue pledged allegiance to the ruler and presented him with gifts. It must be said that my depiction of gift exchange during the early Qajar period should not be mistaken for a belief that the Qajars were in reality, a, were in reality just rulers who faced no dissent or disapproval. Quite the contrary. There are numerous examples of social upheaval, protests, and rebellions during the early 19th century. Qajar rulers were not, 
for the most part, latter-day Kasra Anushirvans. Instead, I hope this talk has drawn attention to the politics of gift giving, a proper understanding of which should be included in any analysis of state formation and statecraft during the early 19th century. Thank you.